Welcome, uh, everyone, to the 2010 ORMET lecture. I'm Craig Scott. I'm the director of the Nathanson Center on Transnational Human Rights, Crime, and Security. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to just give you a little bit of a background on the lecture itself, and then I'll invite my colleague and uh, associate director of the Nathanson Center, Francois Tanguay Renault, to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Jeff McMahon. Uh, the Oramet Fund was established uh, about 30 years ago, almost 35 years ago now, 1976, to promote the study of law in the broadest sense, and the fund that was generated uh, seeks to promote through public discussion, uh, research, and scholarly writing, which has been mostly reduced to the annual Oramet lecture series. We thought that was the best way to maximize the donation. Um, appreciation of the significance of religion, ethics, culture, and history in the development of the legal system. The Oramet uh, means uh, the light of truth. And the fund was created, uh, there is a whole interesting story behind it, which I don't know well enough to turn into a, a, a nice joke. So I'll just uh, say that it was uh, created from a disputed legal fee uh, in a dispute within a Toronto synagogue. And uh, Mr. Ian Utterbridge was the source of, the, of directing that disputed fee to the greater good, which is Osgood Hall Law School and the Oramet uh, lecture. Now, it's, it's been a significant lecture series. Um, last year, Frederick Schauer, uh, 2009, spoke on law and coercion. Uh, the year before that, John Gardner, professor of jurisprudence at Oxford, uh, seven debates about law and morality. The year before that, Brian Leiter, now of the University of Chicago, why tolerate religion? Uh, several years before, Duncan Kennedy of Harvard, the political stakes in merely technical issues of contract law. Martha Minow, also of Harvard, 20 years ago, putting up and, pull, and putting down, rethinking tolerance. Neil McCormick, uh, can rights be discretionary? That was 1988. Joel Feinberg, um, wrongful conception and the right not to be harmed. John Finnis was here, 1984, whatever is becoming of analytical jurisprudence. Um, Stephen Tullman, uh, one of my personal favorite and not well known within the Legal Academy philosophers, Ethics and Equity, the Tyranny of Principles, and Charles Freed of Harvard, um, almost 30 years ago, The Moral Foundations of Private Law. That's just some of the folks who've delivered this lecture. And I'll say no more other than to say that our present guest uh, uh, stands well in, the, in that company and deserves to be better known in the Legal Academy. Francois, can you introduce Jeff, please? OK, well, it's my privilege and honor to uh, introduce to you today Professor Jeff McMahon, who will be our Oramet lecturer for 2010. Now, Professor McMahon is one uh, of today's leading moral theorists. He also engages in political philosophy and legal theory, as well as international relations. And given the mission of the Oramet, uh, which was just described to you by Professor Scott, uh, we thought it fitting to have somebody like him come and speak uh, to us today. Now, Professor McMahon is Professor of Philosophy at Rutgers University, and he has also held uh, academic positions at uh, Princeton University, the University of Illinois, and Cambridge University. He began his graduate work at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar and completed it at Cambridge, where he was a fellow of St. John's College and where he completed his uh, doctoral dissertation under the supervision of the no less illustrious Bernard Williams. Now, Professor McMahon's uncommonly uh, perceptive and incisive mind has left a deep imprint in every field that he has uh, uh, decided to engage with. So for example, he's the author of such philosophical bestsellers as British Nuclear Weapons For and Against, uh, Reagan and the World Imperial Policy in the Cold War, The Morality of Nationalism, um, and uh, more recently, uh, The uh, Ethics of Killing Problems at the Margins of Life, and last year, Killing in War. As if this were not enough, he also has many upcoming books, one collection of essays uh, entitled uh, The uh, Values of Lives, and two others dealing with moral and legal issues arising in respect of self-defense, war, uh, and punishment. Now, today's lecture on, on proportionality in, in self-defense and war takes its roots in 
uh, Professor McMahon's latest work on, on war, work that uh, takes shape in, in killing in war, and uh, hopefully will also form part of his upcoming books. Now, the themes explored in, in this latest work have captured the attention of serious moral and legal theorists of war worldwide, but also of international relations theorists, of international law theorists, and, and criminal law theorists alike. So no small feat. And that is one of the greatest strengths, I think, in Professor McMahon's work, in that he really leaves no stone unturned. And he really confronts difficult problems in all their complexities without seeking any easy shortcuts or ever shying from, from challenging unfounded dogmas and orthodoxies that may have been with us for, for many centuries even. For example, the fact that moral, uh, th that combatants on, on, on the battlefield in the war are, are morally equal, or, or perhaps more a posit for today's lecture, that, that harm imposed in self-defense and war should, should simply be proportionate uh, to the harm that is thereby prevented. Now, Peter Singer of Princeton uh, University once wrote of Jeff's latest work that everyone contemplating fighting in a war or ordering others to do so uh, should engage with his work. Now, in a world where war is too often a default as opposed to a last resort and proportionate option as it should be, well, this, this statement, the statement made by, by Professor Singer, should, should give you an idea of how significant a public intellectual uh, Jeff McMahon is. Now, Professor McMahon has become uh, one of the mainstay uh, of you know, normative ethics and practical ethics, and, and we look forward to hear uh, what he has uh, to contribute further uh, today to what he has already said on a very hot topic. And, uh, after today's lecture, we might even be able to say uh, that everyone contemplating acting in, in self-defense, not only uh, in war, but in everyday life, uh, should also read uh, Jeff McMahon's work. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, invite you to welcome uh, this year's Oramit lecturer, Professor McMahon, with a round of applause proportionate to how delighted we are <laughs> to having him with us today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Francois. It was a very engaging and pleasing introduction. Um, uh, Craig's was less so because he listed all those illustrious predecessors. My thought was, well, you better get somebody good for next year to arrest the decline um, before it goes too far. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, proportionality today, and that's a widely recognized constraint uh, on acts of punishment, self-defense, defense of others, and acts of war. It's a condition or a constraint that's concerned with consequences, but it's not a consequentialist constraint. And the thesis that I'm going to advocate today is that proportionality in self-defense and war is actually a much more complicated matter than moral and legal theorists have tended to appreciate. What I'm going to do is try to reveal kind of one by one a number of the rather complicated dimensions to proportionality that have been neglected in both the moral and legal literatures on self-defense and on the just war. Now, I'm not going to be talking about uh, proportionality and punishment except to note a couple of respects in which it differs from proportionality in self-defense and war. Proportionality and punishment is commonly thought to require that the harm inflicted should not exceed what the wrongdoer deserves. And desert is sensitive to much more than just how much harm a wrongdoer has wrongfully inflicted. It also 
has to take account of various facts about the wrongdoer. For example, what he knew, what he ought to have known, what his intentions were, whether his action was reckless or negligent or taken with uh, due care for consequences, whether he acted under duress, and so on and so forth, a number of the uh, subjective conditions of uh, desert. Now, many theorists assume that proportionality in self-defense and war is actually a much simpler matter, that it's concerned only with comparing harms caused by the defending agent and the harms that would be averted by the defensive action. But I think that's a mistake and that proportionality in self-defense and war are also sensitive to facts about the agent. The same facts that I think are, are relevant to the assessment of desert. But defense and war, I claim, are such that the proportionality constraint isn't governed by considerations of desert, but is instead governed by considerations of what I call liability. And let me tell you a little bit about how I understand the distinction between desert and liability, because it's not altogether orthodox, either for law or for moral theory. Now, according to one common view, harms that are deserved are bad for the person on whom they are inflicted, but nevertheless they are intrinsically and impersonally good. That is, it's an impersonally good state of affairs when someone is harmed if that person deserves the harm. The infliction, the justification for the infliction of deserved harm, in other words, isn't instrumental. It doesn't appeal to the idea that it's necessary for the act to produce some further good. But I think that people are liable to be harmed only if harming them, uh, either as a means or as a side effect, is necessary to produce some further good, usually the prevention or correction of some wrong for which the person is responsible or would be responsible. And I think this helps to explain the familiar point that the infliction of a certain harm may be disproportionate as a punishment and yet proportionate if it's inflicted in the course of defense against the very same act for which the person might later be punished. So for example, um, killing might be proportionate as a means of self-defense but not as a form of punishment. And this, I think, is partly because to achieve the further good that acts of defense seek to achieve, you may have to inflict more harm than a person deserves, if the person deserves any harm at all. And that further harm may not be disproportionate relative to what the person is liable to, even if it would be excessive in relation to what the person deserves. Now, one difference between proportionality in self-defense and proportionality in war is that self-defense is usually a single act or a single series of uh, acts that take place over a very brief period, causing a single overall harm to the person who's attacked in self-defense. But war is protracted over time and involves many acts by many agents. It contains many constitutive acts. And because of this, there are in war, the way just war theory has uh, been understood in the past, two distinct applications of a proportionality requirement to war. One governing the resort to war, and in my view, continuously reapplied uh, to govern the continuation of war as a whole, and another distinct proportionality requirement that governs individual acts of war. Now, there's no parallel distinction of that sort in individual self-defense. That is, there's no uh, proportionality requirement governing self-defense in a particular case and then governing the constituent elements of the process of self-defense. It's just one thing in, in self-defense, but there are two requirements in war. Uh, 
And that's, that's a, a very familiar distinction. In, in, in just war theory, it's the distinction between uh, jus ad bellum, that is the, the, the rules governing the resort to war, and jus in bello, the rules governing the conduct of war. And of course, those are legal categories as well. Now, there's another alleged contrast between proportionality in war and proportionality in self-defense. And its concern, and this contrast concerns the, har the harms that are considered to be relevant in weighing against the goods that are produced by the act of self-defense or the act of war. In war, proportionality is assumed to be concerned with harms to innocent bystanders. The relevant bad effects to be weighed against the goods to be achieved by going to war or by an individual act of war are the effects that are caused usually as a side effect of military action on innocent people. The reason this is assumed to be the case is that it's widely assumed that all combatants in war are liable to be killed at any time while war is in progress. That's certainly true as a, a matter of law, and that's been assumed for a couple of centuries to be true uh, within just war theory as well. But if all combatants are liable to be killed, it's very unlikely that anything that's done to them in war will be something to which they are not liable. And here's an important point. Harms to which people are liable aren't relevant to any proportionality calculation. They are, as it were, neutralized for reasons of proportionality by the fact that they are harms to which people are liable. They're just canceled out by that, in the same way that deserved harms don't count against action that inflicts deserved harms. In individual self-defense, if you look at the literature, the focus is instead not on, on harms to uh, innocent bystanders, but on the harm inflicted on the attacker. Part of the reason for this is that often in self-defense, it's not the case that the attacker is liable to be killed. He may well be engaged in posing some kind of non-lethal threat, and it may be the case that he's liable only to certain forms of non-lethal defensive action. So in individual self-defense, it's entirely possible that the harm that is inflicted on an aggressor in defense could be excessive in relation to that aggressor's liability. So the contrast here is between the idea that in war, the relevant harms are harms to innocent people, innocent bystanders, where in self-defense, the, the harms that are relevant are the harms that are intentionally inflicted on the attacker. Now, I think that this is an illusory contrast. I think that in war, um, the reason that we think that uh, enemy combatants are always liable to the harms that they suffer, or the reasons that we think that, are, for the, are to a considerable extent mistaken. I won't go into the reasons why, but I'll just mention that uh, it is sometimes the case that um, a war as a whole can be disproportionate. And if the war as a whole is disproportionate, it's going to follow that some of the individual acts of war, even if they are uh, targeted against combatants, may be disproportionate. Suppose, for example, that um, uh, Canadian conscripts acting under duress were to seize by force an acre of ground uh, on the border of the United States with Canada. Suppose there's an acre of ground in Montana or somewhere that the United States is using as a garbage dump. Uh, we, you know, it's just nothing but a place where we store our garbage. But for, for Canadians, it's a sacred site. And you think it belongs to you by history and by natural right and so on. So 
you send a, a, a group of soldiers here. Now, they're all conscripts acting under extreme duress. You send them, and they take up defensive positions in this acre of ground inside the United States and declare it to be part of Canada. Now, I think that given that the land is valueless, and it means a lot to the Canadians, uh, it would be disproportionate for the United States to uh, engage in defense against this form of aggression. It wouldn't be acceptable to kill a single Canadian soldier in order to recover American sovereignty over this acre of ground. So there's an example in which uh, it might be in, in which the harms inflicted actually on combatants might be disproportionate to their liability. The explanation for why harms to bystanders isn't much discussed in the literature on individual self-defense is that for the most part, acts of individual self-defense don't have terrible side effects for innocent bystanders. That's violence that's usually more contained. Now, actually, I think that there are indirect side effects sometimes of acts of self-defense that, to my knowledge, virtually all theorists think are irrelevant to proportionality and self-defense. These would be effects like the grief of the parents if you were to kill your the, the person who's engaged in aggression against you, or the fact that the person who's engaged in aggression against you is a famous surgeon who may save some people's lives tomorrow whom nobody else could save, so on and so forth. <clears throat> I actually think that it's a mistake to think that those side effects of self-defensive action are totally irrelevant to proportionality of individual self-defense. And I may say a little bit more about that in a little while. So. I think that, in fact, proportionality in self-defense and proportionality in war have to take account of both harms to attackers and harms to bystanders. To the extent that people have recognized that there are these two different kinds of harm that are relevant to proportionality, they've tried to combine them within a single proportionality requirement. And I think that's actually a mistake, because these are harms that, that don't combine well. These proportionality calculations don't combine well. I think it's much better and clearer to think of these two dimensions of proportionality as distinct. And so I think that we need to be thinking in terms of two different proportionality restrictions on acts of self-defense and acts of war that need to be conducted separately. Let me give you an illustration, which I hope will make all of this a bit clearer. Um, in 1984, there was a man named uh, Bernard Goetz. Some of you will remember this case. George Fletcher wrote a whole book about it, about it called A Crime of Self-Defense. Bernard Goetz uh, shot four panhandlers on the New York City subway who were menacing him uh, a little bit when they were asking him to give them $5. So he shot all four of them, and, and the case went to court. And the main focus at trial was on whether the harm he caused to the four attackers was excessive in relation to the threat they posed to him. Now, they were clearly potentially liable to certain harms because they were clearly menacing him in a certain way. So if he had you know, beaten them all, if he had been a black belt karate person and had uh, incapacitated them with a few well-aimed karate blows, I think nobody would think that they had been harmed in a disproportionate way. But in fact, he shot them all. Uh, in, in ways that cause varying degrees of, of harm to them. And the question is, was the harm he caused to the attackers excessive in relation to the harm to which they might have been liable by virtue of their action? Now, I'm going to call this question the question of narrow proportionality. It's concerned with the harms inflicted on attackers or people who are potentially liable to some harms in self-defense. But notice that Getz's act also 
took place within the uh, confines of a closed subway car on which there were a number of other passengers who, whom he clearly exposed to great risk by firing off a volley of pistol shots within that enclosed space from which those people could not flee. So I think that's a case, a clear case, in which individual self-defense raises questions also about the proportionality of the risks or harms imposed on innocent people who are just bystanders to the main conflict. And I'm going to call the, that question the question of whether his action exposed innocent bystanders to excessive risk the question of wide proportionality. So I'm distinguishing between narrow proportionality and wide proportionality. Narrow is concerned with the harms uh, to attackers who are potentially liable to, to harms, and wide proportionality is concerned with harms to innocent people who are bystanders to a conflict. Um, <coughs> might be worth saying something about, um, at this point, e e about the indirect effects that I referred to a moment ago, like grief of the relatives and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, those effects have been thought to be irrelevant to the morality of self-defense. They're certainly thought to be irrelevant to proportionality and the morality of war. And they're also thought to be irrelevant uh, to a proportionality in punishment. So I'm reverting to the, to the proportionality in punishment for the last time here just to make a, a, a small aside. And that is that since I'm distinguishing between narrow proportionality in self-defense and war and wide proportionality in self-defense and war, it might be worth, I think, pursuing the idea that these two dimensions of proportionality also are significant in the case of punishment. So, for example, it has always seemed to me in a way, really obvious that if one were choosing between, uh, at, at sentencing, between committing a convicted murderer to life imprisonment or executing him, one relevant consideration is how horrible it would be for his relatives, his parents or his children or whatever, if he's executed. And as far as I know, that kind of consideration isn't taken into account, at least in any formal way, in law, but I think that that's a clear case in which a wide proportionality restriction on punishment might rule that the death penalty is often disproportionate because of the effects on innocent bystanders. Okay. Another uh, thing that was an important focus of concern at the Getz trial was whether proportionality was to be assessed relative to what Getz believed about the threat he faced or relative to what was objectively true about the threat he faced. And of course another option is whether proportionality in that individual act of self-defense should instead have been assessed relative to what it was reasonable for him to believe in the circumstances. So that was a key issue in, in, uh, in that trial. And if you want to read about how the, the different uh, people involved in the trial deliberated about that issue, you can read George Fletcher's book, because a lot of it is concerned with that. A lot of people think that we have to take a stand about this in understanding proportionality. Should we assess proportionality? <clears throat> where we're comparing the threatened harm with the harm that was actually inflicted by the defending agent, should we understand the threatened harm as the harm that the person believed he was threatened with, or should we assess proportionality in terms of what it was reasonable for the person to believe about the harm he was threatened with, or by reference to what the actual facts of the case were. Now, I think we don't have to make a uh, choice among these three options. I think this is just one of the series of kind of points about proportionality I'm going to make uh, over the course of the talk. I think that all of these options are relevant for different purposes. If we want a rule that is to guide people's action ex ante, we have to focus on what people actually believe. 
whether their beliefs are false or whether they're justified, doesn't make any difference. If you want to tell people what they need to do right now, you've got to appeal to the beliefs that they actually have. If, on the other hand, we're wanting to decide whether ex post an agent was blameworthy for acting in the way that he did, then we'll need to know whether his beliefs about the threat he took himself to be averting were reasonable. If his beliefs were unreasonable for him in the context that is not epistemically justified, and they could have been epistemically better justified, then we'll find grounds for culpability there. If we want to know about, not so much about what an agent ought to do in the circumstances, you know, what we should tell an agent to do given that agent's beliefs, and if we're not so much concerned with blame but are concerned with assessing a person's liability, then I think it matters very much uh, what the facts were. It may well be the case that a person acts on the basis of reasonable but false beliefs and may not be culpable for having so acted, but may nonetheless be responsible in an important way for the consequences of his action and be liable to defensive harm or to pay compensation after the fact, even for having acted on the basis of beliefs that were reasonable in the context, when an alternative was not to act at all. Let me uh, mention, that's all I, all I wanted to say about the, the familiar issue of subjective and objective uh, interpretations of the proportionality rule. I'm just going to be moving from one problem to the next here. Let me mention one other related difference between narrow and wide proportionality, and that is that in narrow proportionality, it's perfectly reasonable to suppose that the harm that one inflicts in self-defense or other defense or in war may exceed the harm that one thereby averts. A culpable attacker may make himself liable to suffer more harm than he was going to inflict on the victim as a means of preventing him from doing that. That's relatively unproblematic. This is not the case in wide proportionality, however. One may not cause more harm to innocent people as a side effect of action whose aim is to defend or protect other innocent people. So the, the, the standard for assessing proportionality may be quite different in narrow and wide proportionality. If you're just looking at the magnitude of the harm in narrow proportionality, the harm inflicted may exceed the harm averted whereas that's not true in wide proportionality. Now another important question about proportionality is what good effects can acceptably weigh against the harms that a defensive action causes? I argued in print uh, in the past that in war, the only good effects that count against the bad effects in war are the good effects that are constitutive of the achievement of the just cause for the war. I now think that that was uh, a bad mistake. Uh, another person who's written on this uh, in at considerable length and great detail and very perceptively is Tom Herka uh, at the University of Toronto. Tom has, has took a slightly different view from mine. He has argued that the only goods that are relevant to proportionality in war are those constitutive of the achievement of the just cause and those that are a side effect of the achievement of the just cause. So further effects that follow from the achievement of the just cause, they also can count towards proportionality. But effects that are side effects of the means to the achievement of the just cause don't count towards proportionality. And here we're, we're, we're restricting our focus to goods rather than bad effects. He's, he's asking which good effects can, can count. Now, I think Tom's view is mistaken as well, and I think he now thinks that also 
The mistake that I was making, and I think part of the mistake that Tom is making, is that when we made these arguments, we weren't distinguishing between what I'm calling narrow and wide proportionality. So I still actually think that where narrow proportionality is concerned, narrow proportionality in war, the only good effects that count are the good effects that are constitutive of or instrumental to the achievement of the just cause. They are all connected with the just cause. And the reason for that is simple. It is that if you're attacking people and killing people in order to achieve some goods, the only goods that should count there are the goods, how am I going to say this, for the absence of which they are themselves morally responsible. Um, so if, for example, by taking certain other courses of action in a war, we could achieve some goods other than those constitutive of the just cause. But in doing so, we would be killing enemy combatants and so on. We would be killing them for the sake of the achievement of goods for the absence of which they weren't responsible at all. So they wouldn't be liable to be harmed or killed or attacked. In, as a means of our achieving these other goods. So that would be unjust. So I think that's true of uh, war. You may be able to see the, the, the relevant point a little uh, more clearly if I state it with reference to individual self-defense. Suppose that the only way that I can prevent a pickpocket from taking my wallet, which contains $100, is to kill him. Otherwise, he's going to get away. Now, it looks like that's. Uh, going to be disproportionate. I can't kill him. I have to let him get away with my wallet. But now suppose we add the following detail to the story. If I kill the pickpocket, his organs will then become available for transplantation and will be able to save the lives of two other people. Does that then, then make my killing him proportionate? I think we would say no. Why would we say no? And in, in, because now we're focused on the question of narrow proportionality, which is concerned with what people are liable to. And he's not liable to be killed in order to save these other two people. He's not the source of the threat to their lives. So the fact that we could save two other people by killing this person doesn't have the effect of making his action proportionate. Those goods don't count in the narrow proportionality requirement. So you can see my claim about war as being that point writ large and applied to war. Now, matters are different with respect to wide proportionality. It may seem that all the good effects of an act of war can count in the wide proportionality calculation. And it's easy to see why. If <clears throat> an act of war is going to have some harmful side effect, it may be plausible to think that that bad side effect can be canceled out by some compensating good side effect. When we're just, when we're just considering side effects, good, goods and bads, we're not thinking here about what people are liable to or anything. We're just asking about weighing up consequences. So in the wide proportionality calculation, it does seem that bad effects can be outweighed by almost any good effects. But I think there are uh, actually a lot of restrictions on what good effects can count. And maybe I should skip, so I should probably skip some of this. Um, one reason why good effects don't necessarily cancel out equivalent bad effects is that saving someone as an unintended effect isn't sufficient to cancel out killing someone as an unintended effect. That is, whether an effect is a killing or an allowing to die or a saving makes a difference to how it weighs in the calculation. So this is just to, to say that the familiar distinction between killing and letting die or doing harm and allowing harm to occur has a role 
in our understanding even of side effects produced by acts of war and acts of self-defense. It's also relevant to proportionality how particular effects are caused. Even if, acts, even if effects are caused by an action, bad effects are all equally caused, it makes a difference, seemingly, at least where our intuitions are concerned, what the causal path is. So let me give you an example of this. Consider first an act of war that's going to save 10 innocent people, but will also kill 10 innocent people uh, who will be, let's say, in order to save the 10 innocent people, we've got to drop a bomb. That, drop, that bomb is going to save 10 innocent people, but it's going to kill 10 innocent people. Now, that's a paradigm case of an act that's disproportionate. Where, where the effects are equivalent. Or if you, you know, if you don't think that's disproportionate, make it that the side effect is it's going to kill 11 innocent people. So that's disproportionate. Now consider a parallel case. In this case, we've got to drop a bomb. It's going to save 10 innocent people. It's going to, it's going to kill 10 combatants who are liable to be killed, so their deaths don't count in the proportionality calculation. But the 10 people, the 10 combatants who are going to be killed, let's suppose that they're combatants who are fighting in an unjust war. <clears throat> these, 10 these, these 10 unjust combatants are also medics. They're also surgeons, so they alternate. One day they go fight, the next day they do surgery, then they fight, then they do surgery. So today they're fighting. Tomorrow all 10 of them were going to do surgeries on innocent civilians. And they're the only people who could do those surgeries. So if we kill those 10 combatants today, those 10 innocent civilians are going to die tomorrow. That seems to most people to be quite different from the case in which the 10 civilians are killed by our blowing up our bomb. But this is just a matter in the, in the, in, in, of, the, of the difference in the causal path to the deaths. You might say in the first case, we kill the 10 innocent people if they are blown up as a side effect of the going off of our bomb. Whereas in the second case, we don't actually kill them. What we do is we prevent the doctors from saving them or something of that sort. Nonetheless, 10 innocent people wind up dead in both cases. In the first case, I think we think the action would be disproportionate. In the second case, I think most people would think that the action would not be disproportionate. So that's another way in which factors like the distinction between killing and letting die, different causal chains or modes of causation, seem to be relevant to our understanding of what counts as proportionate or disproportionate. One further point about which good effects count and which good effects don't count. I'm not sure exactly what the deeper explanation for this is, but it, there's a range of good effects of war that I think are un, unquestionably good effects that clearly don't count. So suppose that some combatants are fighting an unjust war. Suppose that they are all conscripts and are acting under considerable duress, so they're not highly blameworthy for what they're doing. Nevertheless, one effect of their activity in the war, not an intended effect, this is just an accidental side effect, one effect is that the, the, the value of their investments in the stock market is going to be increased somehow or other. I mean, you, you can figure out the imaginary story if you, if you want to. So they're all going to become completely, maybe even unforeseeably, much wealthier as a result of the un unjust war that they're fighting. And they're not highly blameworthy or anything. It's not as if this would be like, this is not, not like pleasures that a torturer gets from torturing somebody. They're not sort of tainted pleasures. But they are what, we, what in the law would be called wrongful gains. And wrongful gains just don't seem to count in proportionality. You can't, in wide proportionality particularly, you can't look at the harms that are caused to innocent civilians as a side effect of the prosecution of the war and say, yeah, those harms are at least partly counterbalanced by the fact that these unjust combatants are going to become a lot wealthier as a result of their war. And I think, I, I think that's a pretty uncontroversial claim, though it's, I think, not one that many people have recognized. Um, let me go on to another point. I think I'm going to make four more points. I'm going to make them as briefly as I possibly can. 
one point is this. Proportionality is comparative. And it's actually comparative in a different way from the way that the, the requirement of necessity in self-defense and war is comparative. Again, it's not clear to me that very many people have thought about this distinction. That is, in what way does the necessity requirement dictate a different kind of comparison from the one dictated by the proportionality requirement? <coughs> I think the answer is this. The necessity requirement demands that we compare going to war or doing some particular act of war with an alternative course of action, either one that involves war or doesn't involve war, that would have some probability of achieving the very same end. So if we're, if we're thinking about the use ad bellum necessity requirement, our question is, is there some alternative course of action that would enable us to achieve the just cause, but by causing lesser harm than war would cause. Now, of course, necessity doesn't compare war with all possible courses of action. It just compares it with other possible ways of achieving the just cause of the war. Now, proportionality is different. The comparison it requires is one with an option in which no action is taken to achieve the just cause. So necessity asks us to compare war or an act of war with alternative ways of achieving our ends. And proportionality asks us to consider or to compare war or an act of war as a means of achieving our ends with our simply not doing anything to achieve our ends. Now, this raises a really difficult problem. The problem is that if we don't do anything to achieve our ends, that is, if we don't go to war and we don't do anything to achieve our ends, we have to ask, well, what would happen if we did that? But of course, if we don't act to achieve our ends by going to war, we've got to do something else. Which of the very many things that we might do other than go to war is the relevant course of events to compare with going to war? Well, you might think something like this. Well, whatever you would have done other than go to war, that's what you compare war with. But that's way too permissive. Suppose that we're thinking about going to war and we ask, well, would war be proportionate? Well, we have to ask, we've got to compare it with what we would have done otherwise. Well, what we would have done otherwise was to um, conduct a campaign of genocide against some uh, domestic minority, but we, we'll put that aside in order to, to, to fight the war. But then any war is going to look proportionate if the alternative is our conducting a campaign of genocide, so that can't possibly be the right comparison. You might think then you should compare going to war with what we would have been most disposed to do among the permissible options. That rules out the comparison with genocide or our doing really bad things. We look at all the permissible things we might have done, pick the one that we would have been most disposed to do, and we compare going to war with that. But that looks pretty arbitrary as well. Why should proportionality be relative to what we might be supposed to do otherwise? It just makes it totally arbitrary. We might compare going to war with the best course of action that we might have taken among the permissible alternatives. But then that makes proportionality way too demanding. Because the very best thing we might have done might have been to devote most of the national wealth to the eradication of poverty and disease and so on throughout the rest of the world. Um, any war is going to fall short of that comparison. So any war is going to be disproportionate on, on that comparison. So um, I don't know what to do about this. You might think this is a kind of abstract theoretical philosopher's problem. It's a problem about counterfactual comparisons. But I can't think of an answer to it. I can't think of a solution to this. And I'm bothered by that. So I mentioned that. And, and leave you with it. <clears throat>
Another dimension to proportionality that I think is often, or in fact almost universally ignored, is that proportionality is sensitive, at least as common sense considers this matter, to the intentions with which an agent acts. Most of us think that the intentions with which an agent acts are relevant to the permissibility of the action. And I think that our intuitions suggest that intentions are relevant to, for example, liability and therefore to proportionality. We can break down, I mean, see, so you, you take, take my initial distinction between narrow and wide proportionality, add to it the distinction between intended effects and unintended effects, and you get four categories of effect here. There are intended harms to those who are potentially liable to some harm. That, that takes care of most acts of war directed against military targets. So in, in most of acts of war, we're intending to harm certain people whom we believe or who we believe are potentially liable to some harms, namely the enemy combatants. But we can also harm enemy combatants who we believe to be liable to some harm unintentionally. And we typically count that as a good thing if we kill some enemy combatants and inadvertently that's counted as a good effect. There are intended harms to people who are not liable to any harms. This would be acts of terrorism, for example, fit in that category. But also acts of war or acts of self-defense um, that may have, instead of a justification of liability, a justification of necessity. And I actually think necessity justifications are often just a kind of species of proportionality. That is, we're harming these people, they're innocent people. Um, is the harm that we inflict on them for the sake of some much greater good proportionate in relation to that greater good? Um, so necessity justifications really are proportionality calculations, in my view, where they, uh, in particular where they involve intended harms to people who are innocent. But I think most of us in our intuitions think that the standard of justification for the intentional infliction of harm on an innocent person is higher than that for the unintentional but foreseen infliction of a harm on an innocent person. That has been a standard view in just war theory from its inception. That and it's related, of course, to the doctrine of double effect, if you know what that is. The idea here is that the weight that harms to the innocent have is diminished somewhat in the proportionality calculation if those harms are unintended rather than intended as a means. Now, I think that actually has an important implication for proportionality in war. And it is this, that sometimes civilians, some civilians, bear some degree of responsibility for the unjust war that their country is fighting. I think most of us believe that that was true of a number of adult Germans with respect to the Second World War. Many of them were complicit in various ways with uh, that war. Now, I think that the degree to which some civilians may be responsible for an unjust war is very rarely high enough to make them liable to intentional attack in war. Nevertheless, the degree of their responsibility may be high enough that if they get harmed as a side effect of military action against their country, they may not be wronged by that. They may have no justified complaint against being harmed in that way if conducting those military operations is necessary for military success against their country which is fighting an unjust war. So what that means is that in some cases civilians on my view can be liable not so much to intentionally inflicted harms but they may be liable to suffer some of the harms that civilians suffer as a foreseen but unintended side effect of acts of war. Now you may be thinking, as most people do, that the idea of civilian liability is a bad idea, it's a dangerous idea, it's on a slippery slope towards terrorism. I agree with you on that last point. It's a, it is a kind of dangerous idea. But I think it's an idea that most of us accept <clears throat> at lower levels. Uh, 
So for example, in the aftermath of an unjust war, a lot of people think that civilians who made important contributions to that unjust war might be liable to have to uh, contribute to the payment of reparations to the victims of the unjust war. Or they might be liable during the war to, the, to suffer some of the effects of economic sanctions or civilians in the aftermath of an unjust war may be liable to suffer uh, an occupation for a particular period of time. I think, for example, most of us would believe that many adult German civilians were not wronged by being subject to temporary occupation in the aftermath of World War II. That's another way of saying, I think, they were liable to suffer the burdens of occupation by virtue of their contributions to the war. Now, I'm not saying that's true of all of them, but I'm saying it is true of some of them. So that's another kind of uh, practical implication of the claims I'm making here about proportionality. Very quickly, two more, two more points, and I'm going to try to get these in quickly. I've, gone on, I've been going for almost 50 minutes. I'll try to stop very soon, so I won't go an hour. Um, an even more important or practically important claim that I want to make about proportionality is this. Just war theorists have always assumed, or not always, but for the past few centuries, just war theorists have taken it as an axiom that the proportionality requirement in war applies equally to combatants on both sides and can be equally easily satisfied by combatants on both sides. Yet, it's obvious that no war that's unjust because it lacks a just cause can be proportional, proportionate in the ad bellum sense. That is, if you don't have any just aims that motivate the resort to war, how can that war possibly be proportionate? What goods are there to weigh against all the harmful and bad effects that the war is going to cause? Well, none. So clearly, a war that's disproportionate, or sorry, a, a, a war that lacks a just cause can't possibly be proportionate. There's a relation between, there's a conceptual relation between just cause and proportionality. But if that's true, how can we suppose that individual acts of war in a war that lacks a just cause can be proportionate? What, what kind of goods are there in such a war to weigh against the harmful effects of the action of individual soldiers in that war. This is a, a, a really difficult and important problem because if individual combatants who are fighting in an unjust war can't satisfy the proportionality requirement because they're not producing any goods that can be weighed against the bad and harmful effects of their action, then they can't be participating in that war permissibly, according to the way most people think about this, because most people think that the proportionality constraint on individual acts of war is actually a condition of permissibility. If your action is not proportionate, it's not permissible. So what I'm suggesting here is, in fact, it's, well, it's, it's, it's possible, but very unlikely, that any individual act of war by somebody who's fighting in a war that lacks a just cause can possibly be proportionate. And if it can't be proportionate, it can't be permissible. Therefore, one upshot of what I'm claiming today is that it really can't be permissible to participate in a war that lacks a just cause. Now, you can see this fairly easily in the case of narrow proportionality. That's, that's what's concerned with harms to those people who are potentially liable to be harmed. If you're fighting in a war that lacks a just cause, you're fighting against people who do have a just cause in most cases. And those people, I claim, haven't done anything to make themselves liable to attack simply by virtue of defending themselves and other innocent people against wrongful attack. They are innocent people in the relevant sense. They're not liable to anything. Therefore, any harm that is imposed on them is excessive in relation to their liability because they have no liability. So it's always going to be disproportionate in the narrow sense. Now, there's a better chance that acts of war by people who are fighting without a just cause might satisfy the wide proportionality calculation because there we're assuming that a variety of goods 
may count in the calculation. It's not restricted just to the goods that are constitutive of the achievement of the just cause. But if you ask yourself, how the killing of innocent people as a side effect of the pursuit of unjust goals could ever be permissible, it's, it, it's hard to come up with any kind of plausible answer there. Uh, they just can't be permissible. The idea that there's even a wide proportionality calculation to make when you're aiming to achieve unjust ends is itself questionable. So I'm going to go out and murder people. And, 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 and somebody says to me, well, have you considered the, whether the side effects of your murders are going to balance out? Is your, you know, you, you, you know, you're going to have these side effects on, on innocent people. Are they going to balance out so that your action is proportionate in the wide sense? Looks like that question doesn't even arise. Last point, and then I'll stop. I'm sorry for going on for so long. This, I think, is, is, is also an important point. That was a point that was of, uh, of uh, importance practically. This is a point that's of importance theoretically. If you look back at the debates that people had about uh, the way the wars in Kosovo and the recent war in Gaza were conducted, you'll find a lot of people who condemned the NATO action in Kosovo and the Israeli action in Gaza on the ground that they were disproportionate. I'm inclined to think that that was, you know, there may be some substance to those claims, but if you look at the actual claims as they were made, I think they weren't actually claims about proportionality. They were claims about something else. So what I'm going to do here in the final minutes of the talk is just to distinguish something that's not proportionality um, when people actually think that it is. Consider, let I me mean, just take hypothetically some act of war in the Israeli invasion of Gaza in 2008, 2009. Suppose this act saves some innocent people and it kills some innocent Gazans. Now we can imagine such a case being proportionate in the wide sense. We can kind of imagine a case of this sort in the abstract. Suppose this particular military act is going to save a certain number of Israeli civilians, but it's going to kill a, a lesser number of innocent Palestinian civilians. So we can already decide that this act of war is proportionate. Now suppose that they're in the wide sense. Now suppose there's an alternative act that could be done that would save the same number of innocent Israeli civilians and kill fewer Gazan civilians, but it would mean that more Israeli soldiers would be killed by their adversaries. And what's more, the number of Israeli soldiers who, the, the increase in the number of Israeli soldiers who would be killed would be greater than the decrease in the number of innocent Gazans who would be killed. Is that, is that making sense to you? So that this is, the alternative course of action is one in which more people are going to be killed overall but fewer enemy civilians are going to be killed. Now, I think the fact that, the, let's say, the only alternative to, to this action would involve killing more people makes it the case that the act that would kill more Gazan civilians is not only proportionate, which we've already stipulated, but also necessary. That is, there is no other act that would achieve the same good goal, the saving of the Israeli civilians, that would cause less harm overall. So we've identified here an act of war that kills some innocent people as a side effect. I've stipulated that it's proportionate. And I've, I've claimed that, it's also that it also satisfies the requirement of necessity. But there's still a further question here. And the question is this. We have a choice here between killing some innocent civilians or allowing more of our own soldiers to be killed. And if we go for the second choice, more people are going to be killed overall, but fewer civilians are going to be killed by us. What ought we to do? There's certainly a very good case for the claim that 
we ought to do the act that involves our killing fewer innocent people as a side effect, even though that means that our soldiers are going to suffer greater harms themselves. A lot of people made precisely that claim about the NATO intervention in Kosovo and about the Israeli uh, intervention in Gaza. That was the claim. We should have taken more harm to our, they, we or they should have taken more harm to their own combatants in order to have caused fewer deaths to innocent civilians. What I'm claiming is that that kind of claim needn't be a claim about proportionality. It's, not, it's often not a claim about proportionality or a claim about necessity. It's a claim about something else. It's a claim about the just distribution of harm between rescuers, beneficiaries, and innocent bystanders. That's a separate issue. It's a, it's a question that arises in the conduct of war. It's also a question that can arise in cases of individual self-defense. But it's a separate issue. So if, if I'm right in suggesting that that's separable from proportionality, what I've done here is to identify a hitherto unrecognized principle of use in bello and a hitherto unrecognized principle of, that governs the morality of individual self-defense. So there's, there's a, this unrecognized dimension to defensive violence that people have in the past thought was just a matter of proportionality. But if you follow what I, wh followed what I've said earlier in the talk, these considerations don't fit into any of the kinds of categories, uh, either the traditionally recognized as categories of proportionality or recognized by, in, 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 by my categories as considerations of proportionality, something different. Okay, so that's it. That's a kind of laundry list of uh, different dimensions to proportionality. Um, sorry there was no kind of beginning, middle, or end to that. It was just, but what can you expect? Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Professor McMahon, for a very thought-provoking and engaging lecture. Tomorrow at 2.30 in Osgood Hall, room 107, we're going to have a seminar to unpack this laundry list and try to make some sense of it and, and hopefully challenge it a bit. Uh, so I invite you, I encourage you to join us tomorrow. Uh, there are a few refreshments here at my left. Um, we have the room until 5 o'clock, so feel free to serve yourself if you want to. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, okay, I was well, assuming there would be questions. I'm happy. Sure. So yeah. we can take some questions then, uh, perhaps for another 15, 20 minutes. And then, and then if you have longer and deeper questions and you're available to ask them tomorrow, then I'd encourage you to do so. so. You know what, what yeah. you could, well, no, I don't know. I was going to suggest that might be disruptive. Uh, anybody who's desperately hungry or thirsty but wants to stay for discussion could go get something, I guess. Sure. So. Any questions? Yes, madam. Uh, professor, thank you very much. Um, in Canada, we seem to be uh, talking and thinking a lot lately on official levels about torture. And um, I'm wondering what your construct does with torture within a just war, a single just war. What to do? Well, um, let me give you the, the sort of quick answer to that. It seems to me that if a person can be liable to be killed uh, in self-defense or in defense of other innocent people, it must be possible also for a person to be liable to be tortured uh, uh, in self-defense or in defense of other people. That's unlikely to arise um, because in order to be able to torture somebody, that person has already got to be kind of incapacitated. So it's hard for such a person to be posing a threat to you while you're torturing him. But in the familiar and notorious ticking bomb cases and so on, we have examples where people, in effect, are posing a threat to you. And the only way you can defend yourself and other innocent people from the threat that they pose is by trying to get information from them. And it's assumed that torture is the best means for doing that. So if you grant a number of empirical assumptions, 
it seems to me that there can, in theory, be a moral justification for torture. Namely, you torture somebody who's liable to be tortured as a means of extracting information from him that will enable uh, the torturers to defend innocent people against some action that he has already done in the past, but where the, the harmful effects haven't occurred yet. Now, the question, I think, is how common are such cases? What's their relevance for matters of policy and law? So I'm not an absolutist, a moral absolutist about torture. The odd thing about the torture debate is that you get a bunch of philosophers and liberal theorists who are not absolutists about anything else claiming that torture can never, in principle, be justified. They think everything else can, in principle, be justified. But they, t they take something like the Catholic view of torture, which is absolutely ruled out no matter what the consequences, even if the skies may fall. And that seems to me a bad idea, both intellectually and strategically or tactically, as it were. It just puts these, it has these people uttering implausible and inconsistent things. So the thing to do is to admit, yeah, torture can be morally justified in some highly circumscribed circumstances. Then the relevant question, the important practical question is, what does that tell us about what law and policy ought to be about torture? And my view about that is that if you look at human history and see how pervasive the practice of torture has been and ask how often has it actually been justified, you'll find it's very hard to point to any actual cases, uh, particularly actual cases where, where it was predictably justified or justifiable. Rather, torture tends to be uh, an instrument used by bad people in support of unjust aims. It's not used in ticking bomb cases. So what we really want to do is to have law that prevents the people who are disposed to engage in torture from doing it, given that in almost all cases, they'll be doing it for bad reasons. So in my view, we ought to have both domestic and international law that rules out torture absolutely. That's not an absolute moral prohibition, but it's a kind of absolute legal prohibition. And I would even go so far as to recommend that uh, it be a prohibition that cannot be, um, against which one can't defend oneself by a justification of necessity. That is, in a ticking bomb case, if you torture somebody, you get punished, in my view, even though you do morally the required thing. In the ticking bomb case, I think you're morally fully justified in torturing the terrorist, and you're morally required to do it. But I still think it should be illegal for you to do it. Yes. Uh, professor, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to carry your Israeli Gaza scenario a little bit further. Um, well, actually, a lot further, maybe a bit too to the three. Um, consider that one option um, is Israel may have had that would have achieved all its military objectives um, and but also and, and also minimize uh, to an absolute minimum the number of Israeli military lives it put at risk would be to just lay down a pearl necklace of nuclear explosions um, throughout the Gaza Strip and completely destroy it and obtain all its military objectives and very few, if any, Israeli military lives would be lost. So, um, carrying on uh, with the analysis that you report in the last bit of your talk, do you see a proportionality issue uh, in that situation, or is that also um, uh, something else, a matter of something else that you described it? Yeah, I actually, to me, that's not, I mean, that proposal doesn't get to the point where proportionality questions arise. It's more like the case that I said when somebody says, OK, I'm going to go out and commit a series of murders. And somebody asks, well, what about the side effects? Are you sure the good and bad side effects are going to balance out so that the good effects outweigh the bad? That question just doesn't arise because the, the, the intrinsic moral nature of the aims and the primary acts is such that they're all impermissible. 
they're impermissible on, uh, what in, on grounds of what in just war theory is called discrimination. I mean, this is just the intentional killing of innocent people. And there's no, the only way that you can justify the intentional killing of innocent people is through some sort of necessity justification. What that means is that the killing of these innocent people is necessary in order to avert some vastly worse harms to others. Not just marginally worse, but vastly worse. worse. So killing off a whole national group or a substantial portion of a national group by obliterating their, the, the area in which they live uh, is not something that I can imagine being necessary in order to avoid some much greater catastrophe. So it's just, it, it's, it's wrongful killing of innocent people intentionally and questions of proportionality don't even arise. Uh, one question uh, that you brought up in talk about civilians and possibly that some should be liable to um, harm as long as it's not you know, intentional. What of states that aren't in a certain democracy where this, the civilian population doesn't really have a choice on whether the state goes or does not go to war? In that case, I, I, I suppose civilians would be less, less liable to these harms. And what will what, what be the analysis for those cases where civilians don't really have control over the state and its decisions to, you know, in theory, put the whole country at risk? Yeah, the, this, the idea of civilian liability is in a way bad news for citizens of democratic countries. Um, because citizens of democratic countries have more options for influencing the actions of their state. And to the extent that they don't exercise those options or they use those options to direct the actions of their state in, 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 towards wrongful action, they can be responsible and therefore liable for the act of, acts of their country to a greater degree than is generally true of the citizens of states that are organized on non-democratic or totalitarian or authoritarian lines. Now, there is a further thing to be said about that, though, and that is that I think people also have some responsibility for the form of government to which they submit. Um, people don't have to be ruled by dictators and tyrants and so on. Uh, they can be responsible for that too. But I, I do agree with you that the, um, to the extent that they submit to tyrants and dictators under extreme duress, they do have much more powerful excusing conditions that apply to their uh, action than citizens in democratic countries do. So I do think that there is this asymmetry here. And it works to the detriment of the good guys, as it were. I mean, the people in democratic countries. We are potentially more responsible for the acts of our governments and therefore potentially more liable to suffer uh, certain harms uh, if that's necessary for the prevention or correction of the wrongs in which our countries engage. Um, my question, I guess, I guess relates to um, your distinctions between uh, the application of proportionality during war and in terms of self-defense. Um, you use the example of Montana, where if Canadians were to take a, a piece of Montana, then the proportionality that's applicable there is quite different. Or, um, I guess in other words, the attack should be less in terms of, um, I, I'm not quite sure how you constructed it, but. I, what I claimed really was that that I guess in international law, that would be a war against the United States. That war ought to have been unopposed on, you know, and the reason it should have been unopposed was grounds of proportionality. That is, I think in a case like that, I mean, I'm thinking of something like the Falklands War. Um, take, take, so take a realistic case, not a silly made-up case of Canada annexing one acre of American soil. Uh, 
take a case of the Falklands War. Um, it was a case in which thousands of uh, pe uh, combatants died. It was actually a war at sea, and therefore a war with very few, if any, side effects on innocent people, innocent in, in the commonly understood sense. But it was a war in which um, a lot of uh, let's see, Argentine combatants died. Uh, when, for example, Britain sank the Belgrano, I think there were a thousand, a thousand Argentine combatants on board. Was sovereignty over the Falklands Islands worth that? I don't know. Turns out that the, the indirect side effects became very relevant in that case. I'm, I'm straying from your question, but interestingly, one thing that happened in that case was that the Falklands War did uh, have, have an effect on undermining the support within the country and within the region for the generals in, in Argentina. So it had this salutary effect in South America of, of helping to get rid of one of the worst regimes in recent memory. I guess my question then is, you know, if, if that is the claim, then aren't you kind of forgetting how international law is constructed? So sovereignty itself, if I attack, if I come into your space, am I not allowed to repel you? And here it goes to the ideas of ownership and property itself. Mm -hmm. So then I guess what you're proposing is a reconstruction of those ideas. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that the law of use ad bellum as we have it now is <coughs> extremely crude um, and relies on notions that I think are blunt instruments and outdated like the notion of sovereignty. Sovereignty is supposed to protect the collective self-determination of a particular group of people. What we discovered over the 20th century is that states typically, not atypically, but typically contain no single collective self, but a plurality of collective selves that may be striving with one another and so on. So that the doctrine of state sovereignty doesn't provide for protection of collective self-determination. What it provides for, in a way, is the protection of the self-determination of the dominant group within the state, which has been free to continue to control and repress other national groups that may not be part of the collective self that constitutes the dominant group. So yeah, I'm, I'm not a, um, I think the utility of the notion of sovereignty is long past. And that notion needs to be revised in the way that it appears in international law, and in particular in the law of use ad bellum. And the idea that any kind of um, threat to, uh, what is it, you know, territorial integrity or that kind of thing uh, counts as a just cause for war is, is a mistake. I also think that, just by the way, that um, the whole way that international law is organized around the assumption that the relevant agents and victims and so on are states rather than individuals is, is problematic. And I, I, much, I much prefer the structure of international criminal law, which allows that individuals can be uh, subjects of the law as well. Um. Now, I know you've been speaking from an international law perspective, but do you see uh, how the moral theories that, you're, that you've described here can be annexed and placed within, within a national context and be used as justification for uh, civil oppression within a state? For instance, used for civil oppression within the states. For instance, you're you're from Rutgers, correct? So say Camden, New Jersey, not a great neighborhood. Uh, you have you have state oppression in Camden, trying to eliminate the threat of um, you know rampant drug warfare in there. Uh, but they're doing it in a way at which they're putting civilian lives in Camden at risk. Now, to put it in that perspective, do you, do you see that 
do you see the same moral justification for that kind of measure within a national context where you know it's your own people that you're up against as in an international context? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, that's really helpful. The answer is, yes, I do, but you have to be careful about which way you think the inference goes. That is, I think that law enforcement and police action and just war are largely the same sort of thing and are governed by the same principles. Now, most people think there are the norms for police action, there's law enforcement, that's one thing, and there's war, that's something totally different. And in fact, the conventions and norms and laws that we have governing those two activities as, you know, as we have them are utterly different. But I've been talking today primarily about morality. And morally, I think that just war is just um, enforcement of moral law against offenders against moral law. Um, and I do actually think it is another, another important point that the uh, elements of domestic criminal <coughs> law are actually much closer to the principles of ordinary morality than the laws of war and the international laws are. That doesn't mean that I think that police action in urban areas in the United States against people who are involved in the drug trade is just or proportionate. Um, I think, first of all, we shouldn't have these drug laws. I mean, I, I, mean, I just, I, I think the legal prohibition of drugs is just a bad idea in itself. We shouldn't have police pursuing people who are taking drugs. We, if, we, if we didn't criminalize drug use, we wouldn't have the gangs fighting each other in the cities in the first place. We could sell drugs in other ways. It wouldn't be a criminal activity. Um, even so, given that drugs in the United States are drug use and drug sales are criminalized, uh, often the, uh, and I take this to be part of your point, often the police action that's taken in the communities where this, uh, the, the, the criminals are living and located is terribly indiscriminate and disproportionate. Most people think that there's a restriction governing I mean, there's a proportionality restriction governing police action domestically that's much more stringent than the proportionality, the wide proportionality restriction on acts of war. Um, and I think that's wrong. That is, I think that it, there's one proportionality restriction on harming and killing innocent people as a side effect of one's own defensive action. And it doesn't matter whether the victims are your own fellow citizens or are innocent people somewhere else. Innocent people are innocent people. They have the same right not to be harmed as a side effect of other people's defensive action, no matter what state they happen to be citizens of. So I, I take, again, the, the problem may, to many of you, very counterintuitive. But I think the, the reason that we have not to kill our own citizens as a side effect of our police action over our military action is exactly the same as the reason that we have not to kill innocent people elsewhere as a, as a side effect of our military action. And the same standard holds in both cases. So you can go either way. You, can, you know, one, one option is to, is to try to figure out what the right proportionality restriction is on acts of war in other countries and then apply that in the domestic context. I think probably a much better way to go, just because it controls better for bias and partiality, is to look at the proportionality requirement that we insist that our police forces meet and satisfy. I mean, which they don't always do, which I think is part of your point. Nevertheless, it's there. We should take that, and we should say that's the standard of care that should apply to the conduct of wars as well. So I do, so the answer to your question is yes, I do think they're the same thing. Any other questions? Yeah, follow up. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Uh, so I want to engage you a little bit more on that. Uh, you mentioned how uh, you believe that the prohibition of drugs 
uh, if those drugs weren't prohibited, then the question of proportionality would never arise in the situation because there wouldn't necessarily be a war on those drugs. Correct? Uh, now, so taking, that, taking that out back to an international level, if we didn't uh, criminalize, not criminalize, but sort of uh, evilize a, a nation or a population the same way we evilized the illegal drugs, then we would never reach the necessary level to debate proportionality of war, correct? No. Um, because because the, war on, the war on drugs is purported as protecting those, you know, we have to fight, fight drugs because if we don't, they'll run rampant among our society and, you know, ruin the stability of our nation that we have. And that same sort of that same sort of sentiment is used to justify war between states. If we don't neutralize this state, they could harm us and you know, ruin our stability as a nation. Well, look, so the, 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 my claim about the necessity, the moral necessity of decriminalizing drug use is, 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 is pretty simple. Taking drugs just isn't morally wrong, and it's not dangerous to other people and that kind of thing. It's just not the kind of thing that we should put people in jail for. If taking drugs isn't morally wrong, then selling drugs to people shouldn't be morally wrong either. So in criminalizing drug use and drug sales, we're criminalizing permissible behavior, and we're punishing people for engaging in maybe stupid but still permissible behavior. And I'm perfectly in favor of criminalizing so driving your car when you're stoned out of your mind. That's fine. But just being at home stoned out of your mind is just not wrongful behavior. On the other hand, you know, wanting to take over and colonize Poland and Czechoslovakia and kill all the Jews and that kind of thing, that's, that's wrongful behavior. Right. Um, and so but sometimes there are just causes for war. That is, the things that make it permissible to go to war against another country aren't things like, hey, those people in that other country are taking drugs and we gotta stop that. It is that they're killing part of their population and so on. I mean, you know, look at, I mean, I think that the Kosovo intervention, though uh, undertaken in um, a very selfish and unprofessional way, was nevertheless an effort to stop Serbs from massacring and expelling Albanian Kosovar people. And that's different from taking drugs. I mean, that's seriously immoral, wrongful, horrible action. And I think the same thing was true, you know, even in the Gulf War, which I opposed, nevertheless, there was a just cause there. Iraq had invaded this tiny little country, Kuwait, and had annexed it, and declared these people are all Iraqis now, and they're gonna come under the happy rule of Saddam Hussein. And so what the you know, coalition people did then was to prevent Iraq from taking over Kuwait. Now that's, that's a just cause for war. That's not just evilizing the regime of Saddam Hussein. It's preventing people from doing horribly wrong things. And so I, I'm not a pacifist. I think war can be justified. How do you, how do you analogize that to, say, the exportation of democracy, uh, where we don't like the way a country runs? We say, no, no, no. We're going to show you how it's done. Yeah, I, I think that uh, people cannot be liable to be harmed uh, in order to uh, get them to uh, govern themselves differently. So I don't think that democratization of another country can be a just cause for war. What can be a possibly a just cause for war is a, a great body of people wanting to be democratic but not being able to because their, their efforts to try to create a democracy for themselves are continuously suppressed by their government. <clears throat> and if they're all yelling, you know, please help us, we want to be a democracy, but Saddam Hussein won't, or somebody won't let us. Every time we try to organize, he kills everybody. That's different. That's not democratization, that's war in defense of human rights or something like that. You know, people being prevented from, you know, forcibly preventing being forcibly prevented from doing what they have a right to do. Now, that's very different from sort of telling people they have to be democratic. That's unjust. Or, or safeguarding land, religious land in Montana. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, well, you, I think you've actually been talking about what I was going to ask. I, I was going to talk about the principle of intervention. And have you thought in some way of applying proportionality to that? I and mean, say in the case of succession or an internal ethnic group trying to um, succeed. And the international community or whatever decides that they ought to intervene. Do you see that principle of proportionality being applied in this community? Yeah, sure. But uh, it seems to me, though, that Proportionality is always, in a way, secondary to there being a just cause for the use of force. That is, and I think I suggested that a couple of times during the talk when I said that sometimes issues of proportionality just don't arise. They don't get off the ground if the aims that are motivating the entire enterprise are themselves unjustified. So questions of proportionality do arise if an intervention is justified. And th but of course, that's, a, that's a, an entirely separate issue. That's a question about just cause. Now, I actually do think that in some cases, assistance to uh, a secessionary movement can be justified. I do think that there are, as always, uh, really stringent constraints on, on that justification. Because I mean, the, the paradigm of a justified secession would be something like this. There's a territory within a state. Um, and you have these two, two ethnic groups within the state, the A's and the B's. And the B's are the, the dominant group, and they kind of control most of the country. And there's this tiny little <coughs> corner of the state down here that's got just the B's in it. There are no A's who live there at all, just the B's. And the B's are powerless and, and uh, exploited and don't get, you know, they pay taxes but don't get the benefits and so on and so forth. And they would like to just separate off and become the state of the B's. And they wouldn't be carrying any A's with them or anything. All they want is their independence. Now that would be a just secession, secessionist movement. And if the, if, the, if the A's said, you know, we want to secede, we want to have, you know, we want to live exactly where we're living, we don't want to govern the A's, we just want to, or I keep mixing them up, don't I? So whoever it is, the secessionist movement says, we don't, want to, we don't want to control any of the other people, we just want our own little place. And we don't have to kick anybody out or anything. And, and the dominant group said, no, you can't do that. You have to remain part of us. Uh, the, the secessionist group would have justice on its side. The dominant group would not. And that would be a case in which external intervention on behalf of the se secessionist group would be justified. Now, that would be a violation of sovereignty because the government is controlled by the dominant group. And the government would say, no, we don't want any intervention in our state. So the doc doctrines of state sovereignty and so on would rule out intervention. I think intervention in that case on behalf of the secessionists would be perfectly permissible and a good thing. On the other hand, that's never the case. Whenever the secessionists want to go, they want to take part of it. Some of the people living in the area where that they want to be their state are going to be members of the other ethnic group who are going to then find themselves in a very horrible situation if they're taken along with the secessionists. The secessionists may be taking a disproportionate share of the national resources and so on and so forth. So these uh, questions of secession are always very complicated. But in the simple, pure case, where secession is actually clearly justified, then intervention in defense of the secessionist movement would be justified as well. And in that war, the same claims I'm making about proportionality in this paper would just apply quite straightforwardly. Okay, well, join me and thank you.